delighted to welcome Jay Lauenaga for the Basketball Island Performance Conference here today. Uh, Jay is an American-born Irish man who is currently the lead assistant with the Boston Celtics in the NBA. Jay played under his father, Jim, also a renowned coach at Bowling Green before going on to a hugely successful playing career in Europe, where he played in France, Greece, Italy and Spain. During his playing days, Jay won the national championship in Spain with Spanish giants Real Madrid and two national cups with Napoli, amongst other honours. Jay was never present in the, the Irish national team from 2001 to 2006 and then went on to his first coaching gig over here in Ireland, taking over as player coach, one of the most difficult jobs there is with the national team in 2008. After Jay finished playing, uh, he spent two seasons as head coach in the NBA Development League before going on to be an assistant coach with the NBA. Jay, thanks so much for spending a bit of time out uh, with us today. A very busy time with the season starting early and uh, start of free agency. And you mentioned there you just come off the court with uh, Taco Fall as well. How was yeah. that? Did you win today? First all, yeah, first of all, thank you for having me. I, uh, my experience with the Irish national team and, and um, getting the opportunity to coach the national team while I was still playing um, was really a huge key for, for my coaching career. And um, so I'll be forever thankful and grateful to Basketball Ireland for giving me that opportunity. Um, so, yeah, we're getting started right back at it. Uh, we, we have uh, individual workouts right now. I've been spending a lot of time with Taco Fall, who I think is a young man with a, just a ton of potential. And uh, we're hoping we'll see big things from him. We, we've been talking a lot. Uh, t- today we're going to kind of talk a, a good bit about high performance culture. But just before we go on to that, on some of the other panel discussions, we've been talking about development. And obviously you have uh, a huge CV in terms of development and the development uh, of, of players up to the NBA and before the NBA and Development League. Why does that play such a key role in how you do things? How come you enjoy developing players so much and what, what does that give back to you? Um, you know, I, I think of basketball as like the ultimate team sport. You know, it's really, you're so dependent on your teammates and, um, and I see the whole group as a family. So the coaches really, biggest job is just to help players maximize their individual and collective potential. And, and that's a lot of fun. It's um, I, I'm a very, very big believer in people's potential to grow and improve. Um, but, but I do believe that most people can't do it on their own. We're, we're very, we all struggle to manage ourselves, you know, like, like for myself, like I, I, I would love to exercise every day because I know it's good for me. Um, but if I just try and do it on my own, I really struggle. But the moment I get my son or my daughter or my wife to commit to, hey, let's do this together, it, it makes it much easier for me to, to hold myself accountable. So um, I, I, really, I really love my job. I, I love being a part of the Boston Celtics. And I've been very fortunate to work with a lot of talented people um, players that are, that are also willing to work and, and hoping to improve. Yeah, we might come back to some of that in a little while. But I want to take you back to the start of your career, I suppose, even before you started your career. In terms of a high-performance culture, um, obviously your dad was a well, well-renowned well coach even as you were growing up. So I, I presume you spent a lot of time in the gym and watched him coach. And how did that uh, kind of formalize what you saw early on? And how, how did you perceive the high-performance culture as you grew up and getting into college? So the, I think a high performance culture has to be a culture of work. Uh, and that's probably what my father instilled in me more than anything was watching him work from a day-to-day basis and, and just the amount of time and energy that went into not only what he did on the court, but all of the preparation leading up to each practice and each game. Um, in our, we, we have a new beautiful uh, practice facility here in Boston and it has everything that you would ever want, except that it's missing the one thing that we had at our old practice facility, which was my favorite part of it. It was right when you walked in, there was a huge mural of Bill Russell blocking a shot and, and one of his famous quotes that said, there, there's no substitute for work. Yeah. And, and so I, I always go back to that. I think the high performance culture is a culture of work. And, and then it, really is um, incumbent on the coaches to have the right knowledge and, and do the right research to um, be efficient with our time. 
right? There's yeah. There's quality of work and there's quantity of work. And, and both are really, really important. One without the other doesn't get it done. And, and as you grew up and you were coming into late teens, I suppose, did you see much of how your, your father put that together in the college or, or were you looking from afar and you just kind of experienced that as the first time as a player? Uh, I was fortunate because my father, when I was growing up, it was really my father's first head coaching experience after he'd had a long uh, successful assistant coaching career at the University of Virginia, where they, they went to two final fours. He coached Ralph Sampson, who was okay, a yeah. national player of the year, and they were consistently yeah. in the top five in the country. So then he was hired at Bowling Green State University to, uh, to start his own program. And I think he'd be the first to, to say that there were bumps in the road when he first got there of, you know, Anytime you do something for the first time, you're going to make mistakes. Um, but through that, he just continued to persevere and, and finally got to a point where his, his kind of non-negotiables for his program defined themselves and, yeah. and that made it a lot easier. I think, um, and I've, I've, I've said this like a number of times, like the, I worked out with my dad from the time I was five years old, right? We would go to the gym and that was one of the things we did together. He would try and help me with my skill. And I would say about 95% of the time, those workouts ended in an argument or a fight. <laughs> Thank God. Like, that makes me feel better. <laughs> like like <laughs> every parent. And now I have a 14 year old son and it goes bad most yeah. of the time. But what I, what I learned from my dad, which made him a, you know, a Hall of Fame coach, and, and I would say a Hall of Fame father, was regardless of how bad the argument or fight was the day before, the next day he was always like knocking on my door, hey, do you want to go work out today? Yeah. So I, I learned that from him, like the resiliency of, of coaching. And it was like, there's a lot of frustrating moments, but you have to build a relationship with the players you're working with that they truly believe that you care about them, that you care about their success individually. It's not just about, you know, what they can do for you, but but you really want them to succeed. And and I think you do that by just showing up the next day. Uh, like, so college basketball from the outside looking in, it always seems such like a such a tight knit community. Does that make it easier to, to, to get that culture amongst the players or does that take a lot of work from the various different staff right from the time of recruiting them in order to make the perfect knit, knit together culture? I, I'd say, first of all, that like recruiting is a huge part of college basketball and what you value in the recruiting process is what your program is going to become, you know? So for my father, he really values character and, and kids that are going to work hard and kids that, he wants to bring home and, and hang out with his family and his kids. Um, so, so his program reflects that there, there are other coaches that, that value toughness or just workers and they, they might have a different kind of environment, but, but it's really, really important that, that your team reflects the personality of the head coach and, and the, the performance staff. Yeah. At, at what point during your playing career did you, did your mind start to work like a coach? I mean, some players get it really early. Some players don't get it until after they finish playing. Was there a point that you can remember when you started to think like a coach and prep for games and things like that? Yeah, probably, you know, in my early 20s, when once I was overseas and, and playing professionally, um, started to look for advantages, you know, as you, yeah. when you're younger and you're one of the better players. Um, it's usually just because of, physical attributes because of your size or your speed or, or your skill. And, and as you go up each level and the, the competition gets stiffer and, and now you're playing against people that are bigger and stronger and more athletic than you, then you have to find ways that you can still compete. So um, for me, that, that happened in college, but it really happened uh, when I went to Europe and um, probably a little bit to my detriment. I probably overthought a little too much, you know, but uh, coach Stevens has a great line with our guys. He wants us to play with a clear mind and mind and fresh legs. Um, and I'm not sure I did either of those. I, I think I yeah. sometimes overworked. And, and so I was maybe not at my maximum with fresh legs and I definitely overthought things. So 
Um, it's, it's tough, I suppose, in those early days as a as a professional when you're, especially in Europe, you've always got your eye over your shoulder, short term contracts, and and making sure you play well every game, especially in uh, some of the clubs that you played in. How did that differ? The the kind of the way those clubs set up and worked in terms of players coming in and out all the time. Did that change the way that the, the culture was and how you got on with the players? Um, no, I, I wouldn't say so. I, I do think that especially the players that are in Europe and, and stay in Europe, they there's a level of professionalism and, and a level of, of ownership of their own careers that that they that they have to take. You know, it, it's a big leap for for a lot of Americans to to go away from home and and um, and so the guys that are able to last and enjoy Europe are the ones that that have a very professional approach. And um, Bill Belichick, the football coach for the New England Patriots, who's a legend around here, just has yeah. a great line of, you know, I do my job so that you can do your job, you know, and that that's, I would say that's the approach of many European teams that it's, it's just a, every player is pretty responsible and, and understands like they have to do their job, which then allows their teammates to do their job. Well, was there, uh, was there different things you learned whilst playing in Europe that you've carried forward into your, into your coaching career now back in the States? Cause the game has come a little bit, little bit more European, I suppose, in the States over the last uh, five, 10 years. So much, so much. I, I was very, very fortunate to play for a bunch of really, really brilliant coaches. Um, and, um, the the spacing and the skill yeah. that that we were playing with in the late '90s and early 2000s in Europe, I think now the NBA is mimicked. And you know, Mike D'Antoni, when I was playing in Italy, Mike D'Antoni came back over to Italy and coached Benetton Treviso for a couple of years, and then he went back to the States to Phoenix. And I think that's when things really changed in the NBA. Yeah. Going forward, um, well, I suppose bringing you back over to here, uh, obviously, you know, we, we were delighted, uh, me being being well say, I watched on in awe a little bit. Uh, my national team wasn't quite as good as the Irish, Irish team at the time in the early 2000s. But um, you're playing career over here with Ireland. How did, it, how, did, uh, how did you manage to go from player to player coach? I've done player coach myself and it's, oh, it's awful. Brutal. Awful. Right. Well, <laughs> how did so you get on with it? Let me ask, Matt, let me ask what... What was your experience? You say it's awful. What what made it awful for you? Uh, well, I had always wanted to be a coach. And I had always thought I was going to be a coach. And so when the opportunity came up, it's like probably like the, that you, you've got to grasp it when it comes up because it might not come around again. And then just the, the experience after losses is 50 times harder as a coach than a player. And often, like if you did play, it, what, it, that was the good thing about player coach that if you played, you you could shake it off a little bit because if you had some involvement in it, but just as a coach, it's even worse. But and, and then just the interaction with players. So I, I often wonder how you managed it, even being at that really high level as a player you were. I suppose that probably helped, did it? Um. So my my experience was first of all, I absolutely first first thing I did was get the best assistants I could, yeah. and I got Mark Keenan and, and Pat Price, and they were amazing. They, they helped me so much. They were more experienced coaches than I was at the time. Um, and, and so that was a real joy for me to work with those two. Um, and then I was very fortunate that, you know, relationships are really important to me. I don't, I don't, I grew up where my father was the coach and the players were at my house. So I've never seen that divide between coaches and players. I look at it more as a family. Yeah. Um, I know a lot of people don't. I know there's a lot of players that think the coaches are the enemy, and and that's fair. I, I that's their experience, but it's not ever been mine. So uh, I was fortunate. I had great, really a great group of guys that we recruited to to be on the team those years I coached. Yeah. Um, so the practices were really enjoyable. The the relationships and the interaction with the players w was really enjoyable. That for me, the the most challenging part was. Um, being on the court and being able to separate being a coach and a player because, and it goes back to what I said about, you know, clear mind, fresh legs. I, I, I couldn't play with a clear mind yeah. when I was a player coach because we'd be running a play and my job would be to sprint off of a screen really hard and get open, but I would be busy watching 
if the other players were, exec were executing the play as best they could. So um, it was really challenging, um, but you know, an, uh, an experience that I would uh, remember forever. Did, did that make it easier to make the transition into coaching? In the fact that you didn't just one day stop playing, you did a bit of both, you know. So when you came into coaching, you had already done a, a, a bit without, you know, whilst you were still able to run around. I think, you know what? I think my naivete made the transition easy. I, I just, <laughs> okay. you know, I didn't realize everything that went into coaching. I, I didn't, yeah. It's always just kind of been my life, and I've always had kind of a naive confidence that. This is basketball. Um, I've been in a million coaches meetings, just sitting at my dad's office. Uh, I've, you know, talked about basketball and strategy with my father my whole life. I've coached like I, um, I probably didn't realize how difficult it was going to be, and and um, so that really helped me, I think, because as I've gone on and, and now gotten to work for for Brad Stevens here and Doc Rivers with the Celtics and Mike Fratello with the Ukrainian national team. Um, I, I am learning all the things I didn't know and, and learning all the things that I could do better. Um, but to have that experience of being the head coach and, and trying everything and, and now as a, as a lead assistant to see how some other people do it, I'm, I'm excited for my next opportunity to, to lead a group. And I suppose go, going on then to the D League, now the, now the G League, um... What was your mindset going into that? Because obviously I, I was reading that you'd had eight players that made it up to the NBA. Like, was obviously that the NBA was was probably the, the goal, as, as it is for everybody. But going into the job, was it about developing players so that they get to the NBA and that will then get me to the NBA? Or was it more winning games and that will get me noticed and get to the NBA? And, or how did you manage that kind of uh, uh, role? So I, I think I've... Uh, I'm a little bit different than than a lot of people. I'll say I won't say coaches. I'll say just people in general. And I've been very fortunate that I have a great appreciation for for every opportunity I'm given and every job I've had. So when I got to coach the Irish national team, I wasn't really looking at it as a stepping stone. If if I do this, I'll get to do this. I was just really excited for the opportunity. Um, and then when I coached in the G League, it, it was the same thing. I was not in any hurry to to move on somewhere else. I just felt really, really uh, fortunate to to be a head coach. And um, and I honestly like I genuinely care about the players I work with. I genuinely yeah. care about winning. And then the feeling of winning is, is like so good, especially when you do it with a with a group of people. Um, so I, I do, I always try and tell that to, to young coaches or young people that are starting their careers that the, the people I've been around that are constantly looking at what's next or think the grass is always greener, like they don't really enjoy the experience and they don't enjoy their day-to-day -day life as much as I do. And, and, and I think in the long run, their, their career probably suffers a little bit because of that. So, so uh, was, was that really the first chance you had to build your own culture and were players there long enough to build your coach, a culture? And, and if so, how did you kind of go about that, that first uh, real opportunity to build your own team as a head coach? So when I interviewed for the Erie Bayhawks job, I said that my experience in Ireland was great preparation for the G League because the G League has one week of training camp and then you start yeah, playing yeah. games, which when I... The first year I coached Ireland, we had five practices, five days of practice before our first game. Um, and now even in the NBA, we last year we had, I think, three practices before our first exhibition. So very different than college where you have a lot of practice time. Um, so how you establish your culture and how you really, the players are going to pick up what you emphasize, right? Whatever it is that through time and, and through the, the repetition that whatever you emphasize, the players are going to buy into. So it's really important what what those things are. And and for me, it's it's always just been about being a good teammate. Yeah. And then uh, during some of the other panel discussions, we've talked about various things, skill development, uh, recruiting, psychology, sports nutrition. So bringing us on to the NBA, and we'll talk about the kind of culture that you have with the Celtics there, which are 
from the outside looks like it's a fantastic culture, but but how do all those little parts play um, a role in in the overall scheme of the team and how players get ready for games in such a, a busy season? Well, it has to, you know, it starts from the top down. It starts with uh, Danny Ainge, our president, and, and then to Brad, our head coach. And everybody below those two are assistants in some way or another, right? It's our job yeah. to assist them in preparing the team and in and, and whatever ways we can fill in holes and make make Brad's job easier. That's what we're supposed to do, whether that's a strength and conditioning staff or a training staff. We can't or a basketball assistant coach, we, you don't ever want to make give your head coach more work or make his job harder. Our job is to make his job easier because he's the one that's on the front lines. He's the one that yeah. has the pressure of drawing up the plays at the end of the game and, it, and is going to be criticized if they don't work. Um, so that, that it, it starts with that, that how you view your job and, and what your job is, I think is really important. I view it as how can I help Brad Stevens be the best coach in the NBA? Um, and then I think we're just in a very, very exciting time in, in sports and in basketball because of, because it's the information age and because of all of, uh, all of the research that's being done on, on motor skill learning. I did a zoom call a few months ago with Keith Davids from England and uh, he's written some really, really good books about the best practices for how to teach someone a new skill. Um, and I think that's true in athletic development. I, I, I just think that um, we've done things a certain way for a long time and, and not necessarily because it was the right way or because it was a science-based reason. It was just, this is what's been done in the past. And um, I think now with, with all the information out there, with our, our great fortune to be in Boston, like one of the educational capitals of the world with Harvard and, and MIT and um, just a million brilliant professors and researchers that I, I think it's incumbent on us. It's the second time I've used incumbent in this conversation, which I might not have used that the, word. Jump on the head. <laughs> I, might not, I might not use that word in the last five years, though. But well, for whatever reason, I, I think it's really important that that you, um, I, I had an NBA coach say to me one time, like, you didn't play in the NBA. If you didn't play in the NBA, in your credibility with players is based on your knowledge and your preparation. Yeah. Um, so the more knowledge you have, the more credibility you're going to have with players. That's, that's an interesting one. We talked about that uh, on one of the other discussions. So co coming into that, obviously, you were played at a very high level. How did you approach that in particular when you come in, into the NBA in, in working with players? Uh, I would say seek first to understand, then to be understood. That's okay. uh, Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It might be number one, like, I go into any situation trying to understand the people I'm, I'm going to be working with and, and learning as much about them before I start telling them what, what I want them to know about me or, or what I believe. So I think that's, that's key. And um, the, the culture there, I mean, I, I, I've heard you talk before about Brad Seams and the culture he creates. Why is it so good there? I mean, I, I, I'm not sure if it's different in any other team but sp specifically there why is it so good in the Boston Celtics um I, I think the leadership leadership starts like someone will say like what um what kind of leadership do you want or, or like there's different types of leadership and and I would say there's really only one type of leadership and it's lead by example you know anything else is I don't think is sustainable and, and what makes us having a great culture is, is Brad leads by example. He, he has incredible integrity. He is incredibly hardworking. He is always prepared. And, and he really treats the players and his staff with an incredible amount of uh, compassion and, and care. So I think that just trickles down. And if you're, you know, if you don't practice what you preach, then 
people aren't going to follow it, but we've been very, very fortunate that, that we have really good leadership. Yeah. Uh, we're getting a bit tight on time here. I don't want to keep you too long, but I've got to discuss the topic of 2020 and Corona and, and more so the lockdown. So I suppose in the first lockdown in particular, what did Brad, yourself and the, and the staff do anything, you know, massively differently? That, was there anything you did during the lockdown where you couldn't speak to the players in person, um, apart from the normal Zoom and stuff that, that you think perhaps you've carried on doing or you might do again next season? Or was it just completely new? I think, yeah, I think the I think the Zoom calls has, has probably been one of the biggest um, things we we organized very early on. We we believe that a, a better person makes a better player, you know. So so the more yeah. values we can teach our guys through their interaction with successful people, not only successful basketball players, but just we we were able to get some really highly successful businessmen and uh, doctors and entertainers. And, and we did a Zoom call once a week. And those were really, really enlightening and, and I think helpful to our guys. And we've continued that. We've, we've continued to reach out to um, experts in all different fields to, to try and better ourselves and better our own processes uh, in how we practice and how we coach. Um, and, and then even you know, one of the first things Brad did was um, he had each coach do a dribbling workout and and different ways of videoing it. And then we we're going to send them to the players. So if nothing else, they can do a dribble workout at home when staying socially distanced from people. And, um, and that was really enjoyable. And it was really a, a good, good, good practice of, um, different means of communicating with your players and different ways of interacting and, and getting them to work on their skill as opposed to just the old fashioned, just coaching and you do this and that. It's, it's, yeah. I think a lot of the guys actually prefer just, hey, here's a 10 minute video of dribbling. Just do that and then we can start the rest of the workout. Excellent. And I suppose the bubble, um, <laughs> never been seen before. Did did it help? Like, was it more like a college atmosphere with the coaches all being together? Was it was it enjoyable? It NBA did an unbelievable job. You felt safe. Um, it eliminated distractions. Yeah, you know, yeah, that's that's a big yeah. one. The the distractions for young young NBA players is everybody wants their time, everyone wants their attention, and and so that was I think one of the major positives for especially young players that are adjusting to becoming professional um and besides that you know we have a very close-knit team anyway so uh, i didn't feel like our relationships changed very much because we already were very close yeah um but but uh, i do think eliminating distractions was a good one one of the questions i, I really had to ask just my own knowledge was the interaction between coaches from other teams and players from other teams during the in the bubble did you stick to yourselves or, or did you really get to know other people in the league that you might not normally get to spend time with? Yeah, I, I think when we were going down there, everyone was saying, oh, this is going to be a great networking opportunity and you're going to get to interact yeah. with all these other coaches and, and general managers. And maybe it's my personality, but I really, I didn't experience much of that. I was down there to do my job and try and help yeah. our guys get better. Uh, it was fun because we would have some optional uh, skill work every night in a gym and it would be like four different teams on four different baskets okay. so and it wasn't the whole team it was just whoever yeah. wanted to shoot there'd be a couple guys from each team but it was yeah, I don't think it was a coincidence that that us and Miami were the two teams that were probably most consistently using those optional shooting times at night because you really saw which teams worked and and uh, like you talk about culture and a culture of work, like yeah. Miami had players there every single night shooting. And, and those players ended up being some of the breakout stars of the playoffs. What was the atmosphere like on, on the court during the games? I, I heard them talking about uh, the, the teams that could create their own kind of atmosphere. Did were very successful there. We had a bit of a background noise uh, watching it on TV, but was it quiet? Was it, was it strange to get used to? Uh, I didn't feel, I didn't think so. I, I, it felt like a game. 
you know, it, it really, you just focus. Uh, the, these guys are like ultimate competitors. They, yeah. they, you know, the moment they get on the court, all they see is the opponent. And um, so it, it, it felt like a real game, like really did. Yeah. And I suppose apart from the, the huge disappointment of having to go home at the end of it, was it like being released from prison, like everyone said it was, when you eventually uh, released from the bubble? Or did you miss it a little bit? Uh, yeah, not not for me. I, I missed my family. I missed, I had, yeah. you know, both my kids were, were not down there. So that was the exciting yeah, part was was getting to go home to see them. But the, the disappointment of not continuing was far outweighed yeah. any, any release from prison feeling. I, I didn't feel that way. It was, if my kids had been down there, I could... I could probably live in a bubble all year round. <laughs> uh, well, that's my dad. Look, uh, really appreciate your time, so don't want to keep you, and it's been fantastic to have you on, Jay. Um, I suppose uh, from everyone in Ireland, I mean, everyone loves to, to remember your time over here and we relate to you uh, a lot, so it's great to see you doing well with the Celtics and hopefully uh, future, the future as a head coach in the NBA. Um, we'll be keeping an eye on that. So best of luck with this season. Um, We'll be keeping an eye on you. Uh, it just leaves me to say thanks for everyone to tune in. There is more discussions um, on other topics, so keep an eye on uh, the Basketball Line social channels to check out what else is happening. And uh, final thanks to Jay Lau and Aga for joining us today. Thanks so much, Jay. Matt, thank you so much. And just I just want to repeat like how what great memories I have and what great appreciation I have for my experience in Ireland and 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 to Basketball Ireland in particular. Welcome, delighted to see you.